bar here can can enjoy the seminar. I'm recording. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. So, Carmen and Gillian, are you, are you ready to get started? I, I can go ahead. And... I am. I am ready to start whenever you know you you let me know. So. Yeah. Perfect. So so I can just say a, a few opening words. Um, you know, to, to mm -hmm. people and. Um, then I'll, I'll hand over full control to you, but, okay. you know, well, welcome to the Institute of Brown for Environment and Society. Um, you know, so as mentioned before, like many of you who are here probably already know that for the past year or so, we've been having a, a series of seminars and discussions in, in the area of environmental justice. And so today we can look forward to another really good one. Um, I'll host and moderate the seminar. Um, so, you know, at the end, um, type questions to me and, and um, you know, I, I can help make sure that our guests uh, can, can focus on, on the presentation and, and discussion. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm thrilled to welcome uh, Carmen Sid and Gillian Bowser for a joint seminar. Um, so Dr. Sid is professor and dean of arts and science at Eastern Connecticut and um, the new vice president for education and human resources at, at ESA, the Ecological Society of America, which is the, the main ecological society in, in America and, and um, my sort of intellectual home. Uh, Dr. Bowser is an associate professor of ecosystem science and sustainability at Colorado State. And um, before that, she had worked 25 years in, in the National Park Service, uh, which I think is a pretty cool combination of careers. Um, together, they, they've really been the pioneers of, of environmental justice research and education in the field of ecology, and, and I think they're really at the forefront of thinking about what should come next in, in this space. So um, I'm thrilled to have them here for, for our seminar, and, and hope you'll join me in welcoming um, them for their, their talk, Integrating the Human Dimension into Ecology Research and Education, uh, focusing on ecological blind spots and, and connecting culture to the landscape. So thanks, uh, Carmen and Gillian. And, and, Please feel free to take it away. We are really happy to be here. Thank you. So since you've already given out the, the title, I will go on to the acknowledgement. OK, really? this is my slide. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I'll turn my video on. We've had a major windstorm here in Colorado, so our internet is super wobbly at the moment. Um, I want to make sure we acknowledge um, for Colorado State acknowledges uh, with respect that the land we are on today is the traditional and ancestral homelands of the Arapaho, Cheyenne, and the Ute Nations people. This is also a site of gathering, of tra sorry, trade, gathering, and healing for numerous other native tribes. We recognize the indigenous people as the original stewards of the land and all relatives within it. As these words of acknowledgement are spoken and heard, the ties the nations have with their traditional homelands are renewed and reaffirmed. CSU is founded as a land-grant institution, and we accept that our mission must encompass access to education and inclusion, and significantly that our founding has come at dire cost to Native nations and to the peoples who the land this university was built upon. This acknowledgement is the education and inclusion we must practice in recognizing our institutional history, responsibility, and commitment. Thank you. And I also acknowledge that Eastern Connecticut State University is uh, on land that was uh, worked on and um, developed much ecological knowledge of uh, by both the Pequot Nations and the Mohegan Nation. So to just quick introduction of myself, I'm Gillian Bowser, I'm from Colorado State University, but I'm actually originally from Brooklyn, New York, so an East Coaster by trade, but I did most of my um, career with the National Park Service in about seven or eight different national parks across the U.S. And I did just want to say how important it is that we now do start our talks and discussions acknowledging the peoples who are on the land, and as we look at diversity and inclusion, understanding how land is used is such an important part for the land-grant institutions out west, many of which who sit on um, lands that were treated to other nations. And I'm a Latina ecologist. I grew up in Cuba. I came to this country uh, when I was 12 years old. And um, we, my whole family moved to Brooklyn, New York, uh, not very far from where uh, Gillian grew up. And um, 
I went to New York University as an undergraduate. And when I was starting my uh, junior year, I took a plant ecology course where they would bust us out of you know, uh, Greenwich Village into upstate New York. And we would uh, go through forests and wetlands and study them. And I fell in love with ecology at that time and uh, went off to the Midwest to study ecology in graduate school. I've been at Eastern Connecticut State University since uh, 1987 as a professor of ecology and for the last 16 years as Dean of the School of Arts and Sciences. So uh, there is quite a bit going on um, in this area today in terms of uh, the society as well as um, the nation in terms of ecology that we need to work on. And so Gillian and I have been, you know, two of a handful of ecologists of color uh, in the country uh, for years. And uh, most recently, we've been doing a lot of ecological collaborations. And we are tied, we're brought together by our commitment to increase diversity of ecologists. We're also very much um, aware of the need for further research and environmental justice issues that incorporates not only the social science side, but actually does work on the ecological mechanisms involved leading to uh, environmental injustices. And so we put together a collection for the Ecological Society of America of the journal articles that were published in all of the journals of the society in the last uh, 15 years. And not a lot has been published, and there's a lot of work that needs to be done in that area. And so we are encouraging uh, researchers um, later on in our discussion. We're also working on developing the ecological scientist mindset. What that means is, you know, both all of us here today have a mindset and we that uh, is ecologically oriented. We, that's why we're here. And how we develop that um, came in different ways. And so what are the best practices for engaging all students in the field experiences that lead to this development as an ecological scientist? And of course, we are integrating our research into um, the uh, a book series that uh, follows from the article that's coming out on the ecological mindset, developing the ecological mindset and building capacity for environmental justice. So we'll talk about that if you like. And ultimately, we want to draw attention to the blind spots in the research in ecology and to enhance undergraduate ecology education by elevating the human dimension. So there's been a lot of discussion about diversity, equity, and inclusion in the last year, for sure. And this continues in ecology. And uh, one of our uh, ecologists of color, Dr. Brandon Jones, who is the program director for the National Science Foundation and Geosciences, has pointed out that uh, individuals are not able to bring all of themselves to the research enterprise unless you can bring in all aspects of who you are, which includes your culture, to that uh, research enterprise. And that's what we're trying to foster in our uh, presentation today. We also have a lot of data, not our own data, but data that the National Science Foundation has collected for years, as well as actually came out today in a science article on how little change has taken place in the um, diversity of science uh, graduates in the last 35 years. Very little change. And there's still less than 10% of the graduates are of minority groups. And this is also the case for the Ecological Society of America, less than 10% of the society, a society of 8,000 people, which includes people from Spanish speaking countries, uh, has less than 10% diversity. So this is a concern and we have plenty of data to show that we should be uh, exploring this further. So Gillian? 
So one of the things we want to talk a little bit about is actually sort of deep decoupling diversity, equity, inclusion, as we think about it in terms of a science setting, because they're actually three different things. And what we'd like to sort of talk about when you look about environmental justice and the broader sense of who is included in the sciences is how diversity is different outward looking from um, equity, which might be more inward looking or versus inclusion. You know, when you walk into the field, you can see someone and their racial comp composition, but how do you treat them as a more of an equity issue? So we wanna make sure that we bring these three things apart um, and we'll talk about towards the end and back to Carmen. Okay. So we talked a little before about the fact that the Ecological Society of America um, in, um, is very interested in enhancing ecology education, especially at the undergraduate level. And for since 2015, uh, we worked for several years on putting together a curricular framework that was integrating across four dimensions. And we ended up having this framework be endorsed by the society in 2018. So now this is called the four dimensional ecology education curricular framework. And it's on the website that you see there uh, for uh, the webpage within the Ecological Society of America um, website. And the four dimensions, we start with the basic ecological concepts. These are all the concepts. These are the chapters of your basic ecology book which we've been teaching for decades. Some of us have been integrating hands-on learning practices of various types, a lot of active learning uh, into the teaching of the ecological concepts. A lot of us have not really elevated the human environment interactions in the teaching of ecology. We didn't learn ecology that way. We didn't hear about it. And it's usually one chapter at the end of the, the basic ecology book. But it's very clear that, especially for environmental justice research, that this is something that needs to be um, thought about and discussed in great detail. And many of the global environmental problems today require a, a deep understanding of human environment interactions. And not only the impact of humans and the codependence of humans on the environment, but also how do we teach different groups of people ecology so that they can enter the environmental workforce. And of course, whatever we say has to be put in the context of evolution, structure and function, pathway systems, the basic cross-cutting themes of biological research. So that, that takes a little thought, but it also is needed because the workforce needs this type of training. And they've been telling us, the graduates of our society have been telling us, the graduate students, the postdocs, the early career ecologists have been writing and publishing on what's needed for them to make it into today's society as environmental practitioners. So the elevation of the human dimension, as I said, comes from um, the focus of the four-dimensional ecology education curricular framework. And we need to integrate, we need to develop multidimensional thinking in our students. But to do that, we have to recognize that humans connect to nature in multiple ways. And depending on their previous exposure and engagement with others, uh, they, that needs to be taken into consideration for developing field experiences for them. So we have to first assess where the students are coming from and their connections to nature so we can help them develop their ecological scientist mindset. So connecting to students uh, to the place of study is very essential. And sometimes you need to use online resources to get that going. We also need to get students to develop teamwork skills and that requires some thought and planning from the a person running the field program. And certainly these team building exercises need to have time for reflection, for shared reflection during the field experience so students can learn from each other in the process. 
we, as I said, we have an article coming out, which is actually um, a forum article with 10 responses that's being published as a group um, in the next issue of Ecological Applications. And it focuses on steps for effective field experience design so that we can develop the future you know, workforce of ecologists. And the key steps are first recruiting students, not necessarily on their how much math they know or, or how much environmental experience they've had, but more so on the leadership potential because the field experience requires to have um, some leadership component. And then we have students form their own research teams. And this is based on 10 years of experience that Dr. Bowser has, which can talk more about it later on in this talk. So we're, we're having the students form research teams, choosing with given a very specific topics that allows them to focus on uh, building their uh, teamwork uh, skills. And then we're letting them um, connect their project ideas to cultural values so that we can spark the interest and understand and develop a sense of place and a sense of belonging with our students. And ultimately you end up um, incorporating some innovative technology, many cell phone apps like iNaturalist that can help the process. So there's a whole um, logic model in this article that deals with how do we develop a field experience that provides comfort, connection to place, builds confidence, and ultimately builds capacity in diverse students based on the literature review and as well as 10 years of experience for Dr. Bowser. And as I said, so we started talking about environmental justice and we put together this collection of articles for the Ecological Society of America. And what we found is that the articles fell into four categories of themes, uh, which dealt with access, access to knowledge, access to natural resources, knowledge of mechanisms of transport, and ultimately um, research on resilience to impact from uh, extreme events. But there were many holes, many gaps in terms of the research that needed to be done and many different perspectives that needed to be taken into consideration, the what, the who, the where, wow, in future research. And we thought this would spark people into action. Uh, but so far, it appears that this has been somebody else's problem in the way that um, people have taken it to be, and, and that's something that we'd like to consider further. So Dr. Bowser here. <laughs> well, thanks for that, Carmen. So you get to talk about some fun stuff, and I always get to talk about fun things that I do with students, and many of them is taking them to national parks. So one of the things you want to think about with environmental justice is that what is the human dimension? Why do we see this consistent lack of diversity in the ecological sciences. As you saw in our earlier graphic, the environmental sciences are one of the lowest in terms of their diversity numbers, as um, happened here in Colorado State University, our College of Natural Resources is the least diverse of all the colleges. And as my colleague says, we beat out engineering for the bottom slot as being the least diverse of all the colleges out there. So next slide. So part of what we do is looking at environmental justice and asking the question of four elements of environmental justice is trying to take a shift our view from the science and ask about the student or ask about the participant. So look at the social value, look at the field experience, not just as how we teach science, but maybe it's also a rite of passage. And then what barriers does that create for some groups versus others? What is the sense of belonging in a group? And how does that in turn impact how a student who is from a different group feel as part of that culture? A um, sense of place in ecology as a professor, and then last sort of thinking, sorry, identifying with a place such as the land acknowledgements that we talked about at the very beginning, and then identifying as a scientist themselves. Next slide. 
I do have to apologize. We have a, a consistent conversation of questions in the background from my mother's dog. So I apologize as questions are coming early here from the canine companions. So we have this project where we're looking at voices and voices we look at four elements to try and think about. And these are taking the step out of the science to step into the person. What is the identity of a scientist? And many of us hope, I hope have seen the new film on um, Petrina scientists that AAAS put out about science in some of the remote field stations. How do you feel like you belong to the discipline? And how do we acknowledge those cultural connections to place from land acknowledgement statements to other cultural histories in different places? And also, more importantly, with the trials going on today with George Floyd asking about the sense of security for many diverse students, this is a huge issue of security in a field environment. So next slide. So we'll talk a fair amount about how these four things intertwine in where a student chooses or a diverse person chooses to participate or not to participate in the science. And then why has this become an environmental justice issue if the members of communities most likely and very often in different places of the world impacted by environmental factors are not participating in the science enterprise. So that's sort of the underlying theme there. So let's go to the next slide. So we started with identity and think about how do you identify as a scientist? And the question is more complex than just saying, do we throw more scientists at students? Um, but also we think about what a scientist looks like and how we acknowledge what that person brings into their science identity. There's a great article today in Science Magazine, for example, talking about when the bioscientists finally started to look at other demographics to ask the same question about things like cancer, often took either women or other groups coming into that field to ask that question to begin with. So broadening that perspective of who asked the question is an important part of identifying as part of that science field. Next slide. And we also talked about this issue of belonging and belonging in a field-based science is, is so critical. How do we all come together to think that we belong as part of the science enterprise and how do we ask questions? about that science enterprise. And so when we work like, for example, with our students out in places like Yellowstone, it's important that they don't feel that they're other, a different part of the enterprise, but they are part of, they're part of the answering the question for the protection of a national park, like Yellowstone National Park. And that becomes that sense of belonging of a team, and that team is asking a question, and that question has a purpose. Next slide. And then as we started again, this issue of place, and this is probably, I think, for a lot of the environmental fields is one of the most overlooked questions. So if you look at environmental justice as a lack of knowledge and a lack of access to place, to a place, or to that connection to a place, often those barriers to place may be disconnected from the actual cultural history associated with that place. So again, land acknowledgement statements for a land grant institution like Colorado State University, we sit on the land of Native Americans, but we have very few Native Americans in our college. And so when we actually wrote that land acknowledgement statement, um, the three tribes came to the university and they actually wrote that statement. So that was an important first step to make sure that not only that we acknowledge place, but also that we create a sense of belonging for those students to be at that place. And next slide, it's sort of one of my own favorites, is a place that tells a story that connects to your own history is another way that we see students being more excited. This is actually from Grand Teton National Park, which is the site of the first African-American park ranger in the entire park system hired by Stuart Udall in the 1960s. He went on to become the director of the National Park Service um, under the Clinton administration, and I actually worked for him in Washington, D.C. And the fact that the park acknowledges this cultural connection in the place, I think is very important. When you stand by this sign, you see a lot of the African-American visitors taking pictures by this sign that shows that African-Americans were in this park early on during the civil rights movement that Dr. Stanton was actually in you know, remote area of Wyoming working for the National Park Service. Next slide. And I think one of the things that we, are hearing more and more about today with the Black Lives Matters movement, 
that for fields like ecology and environmental sciences, we cannot ignore things like Black Lives Matter because it does impact our ability to operate safely. So there's this, a famous ecologist, um, ornithologist at Clemson University, uh, Dr. Drew Langtham, who talks about, I wanna be an ornithologist, but I, I can't study owls. Because for me to go out at night in a rural place as a black man is dangerous. And my colleagues don't face that same danger. So we've created a lack of access problem to our natural resources based on who you are or what you look like. Next slide. And I always, this is actually one of my students, we always like to share this in Wyoming, is that one of the things Drew Langtham says is never, ever, ever go birding in a hoodie. And in part was that was after the incident with Trevor Martin, but we see that again, the more recent incident with Kristen Cooper in you know, Central Park in New York City. So it's a very real situation that many students or diverse students think about, and that when we want to take them into the field, that's a safety issue for some that doesn't exist for others. Next slide. So I want to sort of urge you to think about and try to be mindful so we have time for questions, that maybe to go back to the beginning, that thinking just about diversity, equity, inclusion is the wrong way. To think about how do we change the view of science or the diversity in science. Because when we focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion, we're assuming that we are changing the science itself that we're gonna change the number of diverse looking scientists. So we're gonna change the equality of scientists in different ranks. So we're gonna change the sense of inclusion within the science enterprise. But we have to get people through the front door first. And I think one of the things we highlight with Black Lives Matters is that maybe getting people through the front door first is something we need to pay more attention to for us to be able to achieve the science diversity that we want. So going back to Carmen's first slide, you notice that the number of diverse students in any level of the environmental sciences and most of all the biological sciences has not changed since 2004, that we represent total less than 4% for all minorities in the sciences. So that's putting everybody together, including Asian Americans. They're very few in the hard sciences and even fewer in the um, environmental sciences, where actually Asian Americans are also considered underrepresented in the environmental sciences, where women currently are overrepresented in the environment sciences. At our university for, for white females, we're at 65% female in both our faculty and staff. Our graduate students are about 90% female, really high. Next slide. So I would argue that for us to get to a question about justice or thinking about justice, we need to bring in the inequality in the environment itself for individual people. And what this slide is trying to show is that you can't look at something like an ecosystem service or something that looks like sustainable development in a climate change paradigm without addressing equality or without addressing equity in the environment. Because you, you're not asking the questions the same way. Your science enterprise is not looking at the different ways that people may ask questions when it comes to inequality to access to e ecosystem services across the world. So next slide. So what we want to sort of close with and hope have time for questions is how do we bring that cultural landscape into how we look at sciences? And that gets back to what we see as an ecological mindset that you have to look at the person the social elements of that person and not just the science behind that person. So next slide, we turn it over to Carmen. So we have been discussing issues of ecological blindness and we've, as ecologists, we have focused on the science but disregarded the culture and that has impacted who becomes involved in doing environmental research and how we develop the environmental workforce. And so we need to go back and integrate all of the human dimensions. There's more than one aspect to the human dimension so that we can develop the science that needs to um, be done in order to achieve environmental justice. Do you wanna talk about this one too? Sure. So 
as I said, we talk about the focus on the science. So what we're trying to show in our graphic here is that where we are right now is sort of this wonderful phase of unsustainable inequalities that we can't quite get to global sustainability if we don't include people in the, in the equation. So how we look at our ecosystem services, how we look at environmental questions, we have three pieces that move that we haven't explored. So we look at an ecosystem service and we ask the question about like land use land cover change across the global paradigm but whose land or whose land cover is being changed is the people side of the question. So until we can put those two together, we can't come to a sustainable solution about both the ecology and the environment. So if you go into the next slide, part of the overarching argument is that we need to get to global sustainability. We have to teach the human dimensions of ecology within the ecological field so that, that knowledge is combined to get to an environmental justice paradigm. So my little eyeball here is this blind spot. So we have our ecosystem services moving and we talk about social justice and we do a lot of, most environmental justice programs, for example, are in the Department of Sociology, not in the Department of Ecology. So you see that that disconnect occurs there. But to get to global environmental sustainability, you really need both. So I like to talk about, like you think about the, the mechanism of transport. You have an environmental justice issue if you're downstream a river or, or if not if you're upstream you may have a different issue but then the mechanism in the ecosystem is changing who has an issue and who does not so that gets us to our last couple of slides of thinking about how ecosystems services are currently viewed in the landscape and the argument that all landscapes have cultures and we need to teach both so I'd like to start this with thinking about a river. And a river is such a lovely mechanism, not just because in Colorado, and for those of you who are in ecology might know that the Western water law is a pretty complicated thing. But the Colorado River is a major river that runs through the West. Um, you know, it's a river that crosses many different cultures and peoples. So I'd like to think about a river for a second. And you look at a river, and before I go to the next slide, I'll try to sing, and I have some friends online who probably get a bad case of the giggles, but think about a river, hmm. and then think about this one saying, wade into, into the, water, the water, wade, wade into, into the, the water, 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 river, wade into the, into the water. water. See, Carmen can sing. <laughs> can I don't know the words, so. <laughs> so if we go to the next slide, that is a Negro spiritual. And why we say that is because you can take that one river and wade it into the water refers to the Ohio River on crossing into freedom on the Underground River, Underground Railroad. But that same river could be crossing the homeland of a people that is impacted by a pipeline like Standing Rock Reservation is facing. Or that same river could be recreation and be for rafting, but the water is the same. So part of thinking about environmental justice and moving to from environmental justice to even a climate justice paradigm is understanding that that same river and teaching it, that same river may have three different views, depending on who is looking at the river. Is it a passage to freedom? Is it a passage of pollutant that will damage your, your people? Or is it pure recreation? And the water is the same, but our perception of that is. So when we look at diversity and inclusion, the science enterprise, and we can go to our last slide, it's so important that we think about environmental justice is really based on who is asking the questions, where the community has access to those questions, as well as to who is asking that question. So if the person, the scientist is always other from outside of a community, can they see what that environmental justice question even is? So until we saw the issue of safety, with Christian Cooper, the outside community didn't see the issue of access of access for most minority scientists, but that was very real for our entire careers. 
So I think it's important that we think about environmental justice issues intersect with cultures and landscapes. So for us to look at diversity and inclusion in the environmental fields, we've got to ask these other questions about the social well-being and the social justice piece. We can't separate the two. We can't solve environment or we can't solve diversity in the environmental fields simply by recruiting more students. We have to look at the social justice issues behind those students. And ecosystem pro processes really create the conditions for environmental justice issue to exist. You're either downriver, downstream, down, downwind. But who asks those questions is what can make it or prevent it from becoming an injustice. What gives a voice to that community, to allow that community to see or to have a scientist who's able to see the same issues that that community feels it faces. And that's such an important part of environmental justice. And as we look at the world in the next and we're approaching you know, the climate change conference coming up in November, we always have to ask the question as we scale up, what happens when the conditions for a global environmental justice or injustices move across large scales? So I work on small things like pollinators, but pollinators globally are declining. And in many places, decline of pollinators will eventually lead to food insecurity. And food insecurity is one of the sustainable development goals. So we can't achieve that sustainable development goal until we look into the causes of food insecurity, a social impact that's being a social impact that is being impacted by climate change impact, the large scale use of pesticides and other things that are causing pollinators to decline. And the lack of diversity in that science community means that we may not even identify the questions that need to be asked with the speed that we need. So the science enterprise needs the entire identity, as Carmen said at the beginning. We need all hands on deck. We need everybody bringing their entire self to the questions so that we ask the questions. So one of those sort of example, and I turn it back to Carmen, is when you thought about the biomedical field, for many years, they did all the research on male mice. And it wasn't until more female work workers came in, they said, well, wait a minute, what if you used to do the same research on female mice? So it's not out of the realm of speculation to say, just by having a different perspective changes the way you ask that science. And for ecosystem services, it's just as important that we change the way we ask the science by bringing different perspectives to the table. And so thinking about all those different perspectives leads us to Carmen's next slide. Uh oh, we've got a stuck computer. <laughs> no worries. So the last the good slide was to talking about the role of the stereotype. Oh, and there, there we go. go. All there right. Go. So I I'm a, a proud uh, I'm proud of having had Chimamanda Adichie be a graduate of Eastern Connecticut State University back in 2001. And she came to us when she was 19 from Nigeria and uh, got her first degree at Eastern and then went on to become a very famous uh, writer from Nigeria. But she has a TED talk in 2009 that uh, addresses the issues that we've been talking about in this presentation. That it's true that uh, stereotypes are not untrue, but they are incomplete. They make one story become the only story. And we need to investigate our various stories from various types of students so that we can develop um, an environmental workforce that addresses the issues of environmental justice. And um, we'd like to acknowledge the various collaborators on the Voices Project uh, funded by the National Science Foundation, the Earth Science Team, and Social Science Team. So this project actually combines both types of uh, research approaches and has very, as you can see, has very diverse practitioners involved. And you have here the email addresses for Gillian and me and the um, Ecology Education web page and website for the Ecological Society of America. And we invited your questions. You, you, and you got in the chat, this is the time we can, you know, enjoy uh, discussing with you. Yeah, thank you both. I know that um, if we were together, there would be a, a lot of applause for this. Um, I, 
just sort of uh, to recap for, for folks who, who came in, um, you know, we, we have a manageable group here. I'm still happy to very, you know, carefully sort of moderate um, questions coming in. So, so please feel free to raise your hand to me in the chat or, um, you know, type in a question that I can ask. Um, I got some notes coming in about um, folks who had to run away and, and plan to come back um, so we can let people come and go as they need to. Um, as uh, I wait for a few comments to roll in, I know that um, Colin had uh, raised his hand a little while ago for, for a question. Colin, go ahead. Thank you, thank you both for that uh, talk. I really enjoyed that. Um, I So one of the things that I was thinking about um, throughout was uh, also actually, um, Dr. Bowser, I, I think I had a, a, a similar um, sort of my, my passion for ecology came from visiting national parks growing up and um, growing up in the woods. And that was really unique and a huge privilege. So I've been thinking a lot about ways of you know, giving that experience to, to students and even to, to young scientists, middle schoolers or, or high schoolers. And it seems like uh, it's just really hard, both both financially and logistically, to get more people out into the woods. Maybe maybe less so from Colorado, but um, from the East Coast, yeah. And so, yeah, one of the one of the things that I've been really excited about um, and thinking about around urban ecology and urban evolution is uh, this idea that we don't have to get on a plane and fly to some remote location to. Uh, experience and appreciate these ecological processes that that are inherently interesting but also really important for ecosystem services and and I, I'm wondering if if you all have uh, you both have thought about urban ecology and um, urban conservation urban evolution this bridging research and the potential it might have for bringing some of these um, these, these underrepresented groups, not to remote ecological experiences, but, but ecology research, ecology experiences right in their backyards. Um, so I guess, that, yeah, I guess that's some, some thoughts. Uh, what do you think about urban ecology and, and um, being one aspect of, of this next step? Of course, I have to confess, I'm from Brooklyn, New York, so, <laughs> so I grew up in urban ecology. So. When I was in the National Park Service, which I was in for a long time, I was in Yellowstone, Tetons, Wrangell-St. Elias, which is one of the largest parks in the National Park Service and one of the most remote in central Alaska. But people are always asking, well, what's your favorite national park? And my favorite park, my favorite public park in the world, it's a, it's a toss up between Prospect Park and Central Park. But during Magnolia season, it's probably Prospect Park. Mm -hmm. I mean, so growing up in Brooklyn, we spent, I couldn't even tell you how much time we spent in Prospect Park, exploring Prospect Park and, you know, the bonsai collection, the, the magnolia, you name it. <laughs> Prospect Park is pretty amazing. And I think as ecologists, we have to get back to that, that the, all these things occur everywhere. So what's nice about working on bumblebees is a little tiny bumblebee will occur in Prospect Park and the same one probably occurs in Connecticut and probably occurs in the Bear Mountains and it probably occurs in the, in the Adirondacks because bumblebees are pretty robust little guys. And I think helping people understand what you can find in your backyard is simply one way to introduce an ecosystem that occurs elsewhere. You know, we grew up right next to the East River, a pretty amazing river that is very culturally rich. It's been there for a long time. It's been polluted. It's starting to recover. <laughs> um, there's probably some debates on how well it's doing on recovery. But it's still magical to go down to the foot of where I grew up in Atlantic Avenue and see a dragonfly suddenly zooming around the East River and then being able to tell the story of the dragonfly with their um, immature, like very clear water for them to grow up. So helping students connect that nature really is everywhere. It shouldn't be urban ecology versus other ecology. It's just ecology. It's e just a little bit easier to see when you've got a whole pile of trees around you um, in Colorado versus, you know, chasing that dragonfly like I did down Atlantic Avenue. I mean, it's just a little bit harder to actually get that in place. But I think that's so important as we look forward now for a sustainable future is just what urban ecology exists in human spaces 
is changing diversity within the ecosystem itself. So rich ones have figured out urban systems are doing really well, and many of them are doing really well in climate change scenarios. And rich ones haven't, are in more trouble. So what does the future look like as we go 20, 30 years down the line? It's probably species that have figured out the urban landscape for whatever reason and are moving forward. Like, you know, one bumblebee, it's called Bombus um, oxymetallus, does really well. Another one, you know, Bombus vandeckii does not. Very two similar looking bumblebees, one's doing really well and looks like it's gonna replace a lot of bumblebees. The other one's busy going extinct. So understanding those processes is gonna be really important. But Carmen's more of a wetlands ecologist. I, I you can talk about that, yeah. <laughs> I am. I am definitely. Uh, I. I am known as the urban ecologist um, amongst the middle school uh, crowd. Uh, I. I did. I was part of a National Science Foundation funded project, uh, Project Wonderwise, and we developed curriculum based on women in science um, research. And my. I'm, my module or my multimedia curriculum for middle school was uh, the, Carmen said, the urban ecologist. So I, but what, what I have found in, in urban, I, I live in um, um, Wethersfield, Connecticut, which is literally a 10 minute drive from Hartford, the capital of Connecticut. But I live in the oldest, which, and Wethersfield is the oldest town in Connecticut. It was established in 1634. And I lived on the Wethersfield Green, which is the site of, you know, Revolutionary War encampments, right? And the trees that I'm surrounded, literally, as I am right now, right in front of me, we've got 300-year-old trees, 250-year-old trees surrounding me. And this beautiful green, and I have goats, and, you know, next door, the, the neighbor, the other side has a vineyard. But I'm only 10 minutes from Hartford, you know the biggest urban area, and, and I see this as urban ground. So this connection of culture, Revolutionary War, Washington literally slapped a block from my house. <laughs> and, and these trees and the distribution of species. And we got coyotes going by, and we've got the foxes going by, and all of this is here. Now, five minutes from my house, being Chester, Connecticut, has bald eagles nesting in a parking lot. And the students in the high school went over to watch the, you know, bald eagles. And I said, why were all this? Because there's a river right there. <laughs> and so, you know, animals don't really think about urban, uh, you know, or, or uh, rural systems. They actually just, you know, think about, you know, there's food here. And there's a river and, uh, you know, good high place. Nobody's bothering me. I'm going to, you know. And so this is what we need to share with our students. We don't have to go far away. You can find eagles literally in the parking lot. And you can find coyotes in your backyard. So how, how do people affect the uh, survival and reproduction and distribution of these species? And that becomes the question. And this connection back to the Revolutionary War, which Connecticut seems to be so focused on. Well, why, why are we so fertile? Why do we have 300 year old trees here? What, what has led to this? Because in fact, the oldest, the oldest elm that ever was grown in the United States was actually planted and grown a block from my house in the other direction. Now we're at Washington last left <laughs> on the green. And um, it was, you know, ratified by the Guinness Book of Records. And then of course, eventually it, it you know, it, it was in the planted in the seven, you know, 1700s and then eventually, you know, lived 250 years and, and died. And another um, tree, elm tree was planted in the same area. And then Isaias, the tropical storm came last, you know, summer. And I'm dying. I say, oh my God, what's going to happen to our elm? You know, and this branches came down. <laughs> and so, so there's, that's the kind of cultural connection that I, that I try to create in students that, you know, things that happened years ago actually impact what's happening today. And 
how and you need to see that uh, developing and it isn't just oh here's a, you know a place where washington slept no this is where you know the trees that that people were seeing then are still around in in a, you know a lot of places right near you so that's a really good discussion. Um, so Meredith had, had raised her hand. Meredith, do you want to ask a question? Yeah, and I think um, Carmen and Gillian both gave some examples of what I was looking for, but I, I kind of wanted to come back to curriculum a little bit and just talk a bit about, you know, how, you know, if you had some practical advice on this belonging, the sense of belonging, um, and how, I mean, just now you gave some context of, of you know, understanding the space that you're in, you know, culturally and ecologically. But I guess I was curious about, you know, creating a sense of belonging in the in the field in general, creating a sense of belonging in your classroom, creating a sense of belonging, you know, within the material. Um, you know, if, there, if there's just practical ways that you would advise people to be able to promote that. I can start a little bit of that because so, so I take students up to Yellowstone National Park each year. Um, and one of the things that we do, and we actually teach, we taught a class through an NSF grant on people doing the field experiences. And there were two things to think about is number one, where are you taking your students to? Um, and then what are they experiencing along that way? So a sense of belonging, I think, has two main components to think about. One is do you create a student cohort that has a common, you know, common sense of a purpose as or you know, as a sense of common purpose sometimes um, where students are working together on something. But sense of belonging is also about connecting to the place and understanding where that place is. So all of our field experiences take place on a landscape that has cultural footprints. And the question is, have we bothered to look them up? Yeah. So you can go to Yellowstone National Park. And one of my favorite stories is, you know, what is the role of African Americans in Yellowstone National Park? And we don't actually really think about it very often. And actually, one of the, what's the role of bicycles in Yellowstone National Park? So that's a little bit of a, of a hint. Um, but the first cross country bicycle trip was actually done by a group of Buffalo soldiers. And they stayed in Yellowstone National Park. They biked 3,000 miles around the turn of the century. So just think about that for a second that you know, a bunch of black soldiers going across before the interstate highway system ever thought about existing. For students, that becomes empowering. That's their story here. And thinking about their story here helps connect that field site to that place. Like our land acknowledgement statement, we're reconnecting, we're recentering ourselves around the history that the landscape contains. And we don't give enough power to just that connection. Like we talked about earlier with urban parks, connecting students to that urban place, that special park for them might be Central Park, Prospect Park, but has the same resources that occur in Yellowstone National Park. It gives them that sense of belonging. I know that, I can identify with that. So what we did last summer, for example, is we trained our students. We had a backyard bio blitz. They had to go out and get all their bugs, their, their um, bumblebees, on their phones in their backyards before we went into the field. Because they saw the same bees in the field. So what that does is allow them to, that sense of familiarity, that sense of, okay, I know how to be a scientist because I know what that bee is. Oh, I can see that bee. I know what it's called. So I have that history. So I think it's just paying attention to how the student connects to that place. What is the history of that place? And then why that history and being part of that team become important. And the last piece I just wanted to share real quick is that sense of belonging and security should never be separated. And you know, Carmen and I talk about this a little bit, but you know, most universities deal with the Clary Act about knowing about criminal activity on your university's campus or associated with your university's campus. So, Clery Act is a U.S. law in requiring disclosure of any criminal activity that impacts your students. And we all report back on that. But we don't think about that in terms of safety in the field setting. So are we required to report back safety issues in our field setting? And that's what happened with the picture of scientists, that there was no reporting back on the field settings. So we set up a paradigm where it was unsafe for women to go into those fields by simply not reporting back. And we think about that, we still do the same thing for minority students, because we don't report racism issues the same way we report sexual harassment. So if I take my students to Wyoming, I always say the question is, where do you stop to go to the restroom? Right, I have to think about it. Even though I'm in a van that says Colorado State University on it, if I'm pulling in with a van full of black and brown students, 
I'm not gonna pull into Jefferson City, Wyoming, where the Confederate flags are hanging. I have to be aware of that. I have to think about that because that would destroy their sense of belonging. I mean, rapidly destroy their sense of belonging. So it's that, you know, eyes wide open, being aware as you as a professor, what do you do to connect them to that place? You can actually look up land acknowledgement statements for the entire United States, who was here, and help tell that story of other cultures that were on your field site, wherever your field site is. But you can also do the opposite. Who's going to be safe here? And then what do I need to do as a professor to keep that sense of belonging as my core thing to protect that student over, I'm going to teach them about geodes, or I'm going to teach them about, you know, bald eagles, but first I'm going to protect their sense of belonging. I'm going to protect their sense of well-being. And they can learn the science on the side, but they need to feel safe and they need to feel belonging. Does that help a little? Yeah, no, those are all really excellent examples. Thank you. And, and it, it, enforces, it forces us to, to do that research. But the good thing is you people have an environmental studies program that allows for people from different backgrounds in terms of your research expertise to do the research so that the co the integration from the social sciences and the humanities and and the sciences can be done not just to deal with the environmental justice issues but to deal with the appreciation of of how these different um cultures have connected to nature um, I, you know, like I said, I live in the oldest town in Connecticut and a mile from the Wethersfield Cove, which is where the Connecticut River comes in. Ships were coming from Cuba ages ago to bring in rum this, to a mile away from my house. And people here were trading onions and other veg root vegetables. And, you know, this, when my ancestors were, you know, in, in Cuba centuries ago, they, you know, they were coming up here. And as a, you know, Cuban person who lives in Wethersfield, which is not a very diverse town, I said, well, you know, I was here before you were. So, you know, and, but you have to do the research and we're not used to, as ecologists, we're not used to integrating this aspect of the human dimension into our teaching that goes back to the um, ecology education initiative that i've been part of we we have to go out of our way to do that integration to and to elevate it so that the students all students can connect to ecology not just those who happen to have been exposed to one person who told them about how the history of this area as as i am where I am involved your own culture. And, you know, that we, we weren't trained to do that, but in today's world, we want to deal with global environmental issues. We need to get everybody involved. And this is what we, we have to do. So environmental studies is the way to go. <laughs> You're here. Uh, we're running um, low on time. I want to sort of squeeze in one last question quickly, if, if that's possible, because it, it sort of builds on this discussion uh, at the like connection between the individual and the institution. Um, so I, I'm, I'm just going to read it on, on behalf of, of Beth Wilfer Cohen, who, who writes, um, uh, she's a postdoc. In, in my short time in academia, I've noticed so many differences between institutions and how much support resources or education are offered to people who are teaching or running student research projects in this space. Uh, so the question is, do you think training in education like this needs to be rolled out across the board nationally, but also globally? And should there be more accountability from those who are in teaching or, or other student facing roles to, to make the effort to incorporate diversity, environmental justice in, in teaching? Or, you know, what's the balance between the the individual responsibility and in, in the institution. You know, I, I don't expect the institutions to have the resources to do that. That's what the professional societies are doing in different areas. And certainly Ecological Society of America is hosting various, you know, in collaboration, for example, with the Society for the Study of Evolution and with the Botanical Society of America, we host um, uh, teaching um, conferences where we, you know, show people, you know, what 
what you can do and engage people into developing their own mod, teaching modules, but we're also going to be putting that on the web. Now, you, you can't expect, you know, when it comes down to it, it doesn't really matter to the, as Dean, I can tell you, it doesn't matter to the institution how many different, uh, how many majors you have of different subjects, it's just how many total students you have. And uh, so, you're on your own, you know. We try to do faculty development, but as you know, faculty development and professional recognition is not always based on how well you teach your subject. So professional societies have to step up, and uh, that's what I'm working for. That's great. I was just going to say, Tyler, real quickly, there's a wonderful article in Science Magazine that came out today on mm -hmm. diversity in academia and it doesn't talk about teaching but it does address the role of a national effort or larger efforts to try and address this and i would say for the final piece there that look at the number the numbers have not shifted since 2004 in terms mm -hmm. of diversity in the environmental sciences so it's going to take more than just individual it needs to be a national level to shift those numbers yet our undergraduate numbers have shifted to almost 50 percent minority and it's nationwide. So mm -hmm. that scary shift means that we are losing people in the environmental fields at pretty rapid rates and we have to get those people back in. So thank you for that question. Yes, we, we really appreciate you having this discussion. It, it's really important. Yeah, well, thank you both so much for, for making the time to give the presentation and, and uh, share your thoughts in, in such a sort of you know, intimate, um, you know, small group sort of uh, discussion like this. It really, um, I think, made a difference and I appreciate it very much. So thank uh, you. Uh, say, say thanks. We, we really appreciate it and stay in touch, right?